Welcome back, everyone. Uh, with this next presentation, we're going to uh, get some nice meat on some programming language theory and uh, core functional programming concepts. Uh, so I'd like to introduce uh, Jeremy Gibbons. Jeremy Gibbons is a professor of computing at the University of Oxford, where he leads the Algebra of Programming Research Group. It teaches uh, on the part-time professional postgraduate master's program in software engineering. His research interests are in programming languages, especially functional programming and patterns in programming. He is also the editor-in-chief of the Journal of Functional Programming and a member of the IFIP Working Group on Algorithmic Language and Calculi and the IFIP Working Group on Program Generation. Cool stuff. And so without any further delay, I'll hand it over to Jeremy. Great, uh, thanks very much, Eric. So uh, hello, everybody. Um, it's fun to be at uh, Haskell Love again. Um, and uh, thanks to all the organizers for the very smooth um, presentation, uh, the smooth work running of the conference. Um, I'm going to talk about, I mean, as the title says, continuation passing style and so on. And that fits in with my research interests in programming patterns and functional programming and program generation and algorithmic languages, all those things are in here. Here's a little teaser. Uh, there's a data type of trees um, and a flattening function that turns trees into lists uh, in the obvious way. Um, and a, we, we know it's kind of well known that this flattening function takes quadratic time because it constructs lists and then retraverses them um, in order to do the plus plus, the append of, of two lists. Um, so there is a, a very straightforward um, flattening function that only takes linear time. Um, and the question is, how, how do you get it out of this? And we know that perhaps as a very familiar example of accumulating parameters. It's one of the first examples one might use to introduce accumulating parameters. You accumulate a list as you go, um, and, uh, and that turns this quadratic time program into a linear time program. So that accumulating parameter trick is, is, is a core programming transformation technique. Um, but it's what I want to show here is it's essentially the same technique as involved in uh, turning um, language interpreters uh, into abstract machines. Um, and so we'll see how that pans out. So just to say, um, uh, I'm going to pause six times uh, during the talk uh, and ask um, Eric if there are any questions so you can type them into the various chats um, and Eric will interrupt me and relay any questions. Um, I trust there aren't any so far, but that was, uh, that was all straightforward. So here's factorial function. Every talk should, no, well, well, maybe not every talk, but talks start with factorial functions um, and it's recursive. So factorial of n is n times factorial of n minus one unless n is zero, in which case the factorial is one. So this is a Haskell program. This is Haskell love. Of course, we love Haskell. Um, I'm going to deviate from that and I'm going to use Idris for this talk. So the only change in this program uh, is a the very minor one of the double colon for type declarations has become a single colon. It's in a slightly different color, but that maybe that's a bit subtle. Uh, there will be a few other uh, differences we'll see, but mostly um, if you can read Haskell, this will just be slightly different syntax and perfectly straightforward, um, except two thirds of the way through where the point of using Idris becomes clear and we really need some, some dependent typing. Uh, but, so I'll start off with Idris anyway, so there's not a, a bump in the road when we need the dependent type. So anyway, here's the recursive factorial function. This is not the function that you would write if you were an imperative programmer. You'd write that using a loop. You wouldn't use recursion. Um, where does that come from, the imperative program? What's the relationship between the two? Well, here we go. Uh, one way of getting to that imperative program is to transform factorial into continuation passing style. And what that means is to introduce an extra parameter, an accumulating parameter, so one that um, starts off with something basic like oh, a zero or a one or here the identity function and it accumulates information as you compute and then when you've done computing the answer is in the accumulator so somehow you have to get the answer out of the accumulator um, here the accumulator is a continuation so it's it's the rest of the program it's what what to do um, with uh, some value so now uh, 
we, we do this by introducing fact two prime, um, which takes an n to compute factorial of and the continuation k and computes factorial of n and then applies k to that. Of course, this is a generalization because we can just use the identity function for k and then we've got factorial again. So we start off with the, the identity function for k and uh, so fact two n is fact two prime of n with the identity function uh, and um, an auxiliary function that does the, does the work. Uh, so the, it operates on an integer, it maintains a, an accumulating parameter, which is an integer to integer function, and eventually it returns an integer. And if, you, if you're done, then the factorial of zero is one, but you're supposed to apply k to it, so you get k of one. Um, uh, otherwise, uh, you do a recursive call on n minus one, and uh, you should return n times n, but then you have to apply k to that. So rather than have the k on the outside, we, we, we add this multiplication, combine this multiplication with the continuation with what to do next. Um, so you can read this as saying to compute factorial of n with continuation k, you compute factorial, sorry, factorial of n minus one, um, get a result, call it m, and with that result, you do n times m and then apply k to it. Now, this function is uh, tail recursive. When it makes a recursive call, the recursive call is the, the last thing you do. So this is the first step in transforming the program into something that works nicely as a loop, as an iteration. When languages that have tail call elimination, it's called, this can be implemented with just a jump uh, rather than using recursion. But it's a higher order program because it deals in these continuations. These continuations are functions, and that doesn't, that's not something we can translate straightforwardly into, uh, into C or Pascal or Modular 2 or any a favorite uh, imperative programming language. Um, so the next step after defunctionalization, after continuation passing style, is defunctionalization. Uh, and the, this works because although we're computing higher order values here. We're not computing arbitrary integer to integer functions. We never get squaring in there. We never get um, um, anything to do with prime numbers or anything like that. All those continuations are of a very particular form. They're all of the form uh, a times compose b times compose dot 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 compose c times for some values a, b, and c, i.e. they're a composition of little multipliers. So rather than actually using this function, a composition of little multipliers, we can use a, a representation of this function. Uh, so we can just represent this list of little multipliers by the list of little factors, A, B, and C. Um, so we data refine the program and turn functions of this form into their representation as lists. And then we have another implementation of factorial, which now is no longer higher order, it's, it's working with a list, a representation of that higher order value. In fact, a defunctionalization. So you've taken a function and turned it into first order data. So now the accumulator is a list. Um, we build up a list by um, sticking more things into the list. Uh, and then when we're done, what we want is, uh, well, that list represents a function and we want to apply it to one. And that's just a matter of multiplying together all the things in the list. So the, the function product does that for us. So this is still tail recursive and it's now first order because there are no functions in there, just, uh, just lists, um, but it still uses lists. Um, so that's still not something you can translate so neatly into um, most imperative programming languages, simple imperative programming languages. And it's still not the loop that you would write um, if you were trying to compute factorial uh, in an imperative programming language. So there's one more step that's needed, and that's to, uh, it turns out to, to be a matter of exploiting associativity. Since what we do with this list at the end is just compute its product and nothing else, we never need its length or anything like that, uh, we could collapse the list and just represent the list again, a further data refinement, represent the list by its product. That's all we need about the list. 
So that's what happens here. The, you take instead of using this list explicitly, you use a further representation of the list, which is just the product of the list. It's a lossy representation, but that's fine. Um, so now instead of the empty list, we've got one. And instead of adding something to the list, we just multiply. And instead of computing the product of the list, uh, well, that's, we've already got the product. So that's just the thing we return. The accumulator is now the, um, the value we're building up. And when we're done, that is the factorial. And this corresponds to the loop that you'd write in an imperative programming language. Um, <clears throat> while n is not zero, do k becomes k times n, n becomes n minus one, um, and decrement n and continue. So here I've written it out as an imperative program. So this is still tail recursive. Um, it's still first order. There's no other functions. But now it only uses whoops, um, scalar data. It doesn't use any other data types, data structures. But this final step only works uh, if you if you go through the proof of why this is producing the same thing as all the previous programs, it only works because multiplication is associative. And if we'd been computing not factorial, which is about multiplication, but a function I just invented, subtractorial, which uses subtraction instead, a minus no, so one minus two minus three minus four, or four minus three minus two minus one, or something like that, uh, subtraction is not associative. So this final step won't work. And you can't do it with just a single accumulator, uh, a single integer. It's quite a nice exercise to, to work out the, the iterative version for subtractorial, but you need something else because you don't have associativity. So my point here is that uh, these ideas of continuation passing style and defunctionalization are very are quite well known. I mean, they're, they're, they're bits of programming language theory. They've been around for a long time. They're certainly not my invention. Uh, and lots of people talk about them and they're very cool, but usually um, they come together with an application of associativity. And usually we don't notice it or we don't highlight it. Um, uh, and my point here is to emphasize the associativity. That's, that's what I want you to get out of this talk. Associativity is um, a crucial ingredient in this combination of CPS and defunctionalization. Another very familiar uh, use of accumulating parameter is with the reverse function. Uh, so here's reverse done naively. And again, it takes quadratic time because of the plus pluses. Um, incidentally, uh, you should notice that in Idris, the colon is used for typing and the double colon is used for columns. There's a, a very well-known fast reverse function that uses an accumulator, a list, um, and it, it, you get there by following exactly the steps I've shown with factorial. You do CPS conversion of reverse, you defunctionalize the continuations to ordinary data, um, and then uh, you, there's an exploit, uh, um, an exploit of associativity needed in order to, um, to end up with the program that you, uh, you might recognize from having written it somewhere else. Uh, so back to the teaser example, in fact. So here are binary trees and the flattening function that flattens them to lists and it's um, it's not tail recursive. So we can't just implement it as a loop uh, because there's two calls to flatten. They can't both be the outermost thing of the right hand side. Um, but it, and also, as I said, it's quadratic time because of the left nesting of the plus pluses. Um, so how do we get to the accumulating parameter version uh, we might suspect exists if we haven't seen it before? the one that takes linear time to turn a tree into a list. Well, it's essentially the same steps, although there's a bit more, uh, there's, there's a new development in this one. Um, but we start by following our nose. Um, uh, we introduce the continuation, a continuation as an accumulating parameter. So here's a second version that does the first thing, but then applies uh, a final continuation to the result. Uh, the continuation is initially the identity function and when we find a tip, its flattening is a singleton list. So we apply the continuation we've got to a singleton list. And otherwise, um, it's a bin with two children, T and U. So we uh, do a recursive call on the left child, and that will give us a result. Let's call the result X's, the flattening of the left child. And then 
We do a recursive call on the right child u, and that will give us a result, uh, the flattening of the right child, call that y's. And then, uh, well, we've got the flattening of the left child, we've got the flattening of the right child, so the flattening of the whole tree is x's plus plus y's, and then we apply the continuation to that. So this is in continuation passing style, um, and this, uh, these kind of cascaded lambdas are very uh, characteristic of continuation passing style. Um, it's not a fast program yet because it's still got these plus pluses in, but we'll get we'll deal with that. The first thing we need to do is um, the difference between this program and the next one is to swap the order. Uh, so this one visited the left child um, and then visited the right child. Uh, but what we need to do, in fact, is to visit the right child and then visit the left child. That's the only way to avoid revisiting, retraversing lists that we've already constructed. We need to build up a list from the right to the left because of the way lists are represented. So the picture is supposed to illustrate the, the right to left traversal. Um, and what's changed is uh, we'd visit the right child u first, get a result called it y's, then the left child t, get a result called it x's, and we return x's plus plus y's subject to k. So this is this auxiliary function is tail recursive, flatten prime makes a recursive call to flatten prime. So flatten two prime makes a recursive call to flatten two prime. Um, but it's still higher order because it's got these list functions in and it's still quadratic because it's got these plus pluses in. So more work needed. Um, we can get rid of the higher order stuff by getting rid of the functions, defunctionalizing these continuations. And again, the functions that crop up are not arbitrary list to list functions. We never do any reverse or permutations or anything like that. Um, uh, only certain functions are involved and we just need to represent them. Now it's perhaps not so easy to see what those functions are here, but we can get there methodically because there are only three ways we make up the kinds of functions that are passed in as uh, accumulating parameters as continuations to flat and two prime. Those three things <clears throat> are in the, th the results, are in the, the three call sites for flat and two prime. So there's a, a call site here at the top level, and then there's two recursive calls for the two children. So three call sites, um, and it, the three cases, the three continuations are uh, just extracted from the program here, the identity function, what to do on um, uh, the leftmost tree, having got the having done the traversal of the rightmost tree, and what to do on the rightmost tree, uh, you have to go off and then visit the leftmost tree. So in this, in the identity case, uh, it's just the identity function. In this case here, you need to know what k and y's are. X's is bound, but you need to know what k and y's are. So this um, uh, has three variables, k and y's in it. And here, uh, the y's is bound, the x's is bound, but you need to know what k and t are. Um, so this has two free variables, k and t. Right? One of these continuations is either uh, no further information or uh, a y's and another one of these continuations, or it's a t and another one of these continuations. So it's a list. It's either the empty list with no further information or it's a, a y's and a, the tail of the list, or it's a t and the tail of the list. It's, it's a sequence of frames, if you like, and those frames are either a list or a tree. So the, the continuation uh, can be represented by a list of either's, a list of things that are either lists or trees. We're going to represent them using this data, and there's an abstraction function that turns this data back into the list to list functions that we're that are the continuations that we're trying to represent. In case you wonder why this is version six, um, it's because this is a talk for a paper and the paper's got more versions in between and I've leapt ahead uh, in the interest of time. So um, we data refine the flattening program in exactly the same way as we've seen before. Um, using this, these defunctionalized continuations, uh, their lists. Um, and now it's a bit more complicated because you need mutual recursion between the flattening function and the abstraction function. I'm not going to talk through the details of this program. Uh, at the end, I'll, I'll show you where to find the paper and you can go and follow it up there. 
Um, but we've just followed the same steps. Uh, we've CPSed and then defunctionalized and it installed that data, data refinement in the program. So here's, here's an example of, 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 of what execution looks like. So here's a tree. If we want to flatten it, um, then at some point we're going to be flattening T2 and we'll have got there by making various recursive calls to, to flatten two prime. Um, uh, what is the continuation we, we, get, we, we carry around when we get to T2? Well, uh, it turns out that uh, at T2, the continuation you'll, you'll be dealing with is, um, is this one here. So it's um, from bottom to top, it's the context in which you're flattening T2. Because we're visiting from right to left, we will have flattened everything to the right and we've yet to visit things to the left. Um, so there'll be a list uh, X is three that you got from flattening here. Um, and, and then there'll be a tree, um, T1, which is what you've got to yet to visit. And there'll be a list, um, uh, X is four, the result of flattening X is uh, T4. Put that another way, you start at the top and you work your way down the red path. And you have to, so you, you, by the time you get down to this tree, you've already got a list here, uh, but you have to remember this tree on the, you've got a list to the right, you've got to remember this tree on the left, and then you've got another list to the right that you will have worked out. It's kind of awkward that um, with my naming convention, uh, I've used um, uh, I, the left thing of the I that to give the, 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 the context from the right tree and vice versa. So these lefts and rights might look the wrong way around, but this is indeed correct. So that's the context you carry in to a call to flatten uh, T2. And then when you've done that, you get the result for, T, for X is two, the, for T2. And then what you have to compute is, um, well, it's X is two plus X is three plus X is four. And then on the left, flatten T1, which will give you X as one. So you need to compute this expression here. But this is a plus plus and plus plus is associative. And uh, the, the brackets here are obviously um, irrelevant. We could delete all the brackets and we'll get the same list out of it. So what this tells you is um, the things on the left and the things on the right, they're interleaved in my continuation, my defunctionalized continuation, but the interleaving is irrelevant. Um, whatever continuation I have, I could just put, do all the lefts first and then all the rights um, uh, last uh, because all the lefts um, get, sorry, over sensitive mouse, all the lefts get uh, appended, that's all these things, and all the rights get prepended and Appending something and prepending something else is the same as prepending and then appending. That is what associativity um, tells you. So you don't need this carefully preserved interleaving. You could just say, well, we've got left things and we've got right things, and we just represent them separately. Moreover, all the left things, each of these things is a list. You're just going to concatenate them together in the end. Uh, so there's an X is three and an X is four, and you're just going to concatenate them together. So like with factorial, we had a list of factors and we do, we're just going to multiply them together in the end. So we might as well multiply them now. Uh, we have a list of things to append and we're just going to append them all together at the end. So we might as well append them all together now. So you don't need to maintain many lists to stick on the end. It suffices to maintain a single list to stick on the end and a list of trees that you have yet to visit. So here's another representation, another data refinement. The continuation is a list, the concatenation of all the things to the right of us, and some trees, the things yet to visit to the left of us. If you just install that data refinement, then you then you get another program. And I think these lists never get, although there's a plus plus in this program, uh, these lists, the left hand side, never get reinspected. Um, so uh, this is linear time now. Um, but that only worked uh, because of associativity of plus plus. So again, associativity is necessary in order to get to this point. Um, and there's a minor rearrangement of that program, uh, which gives you the 
the tail recursive linear time program you might have written is tail recursive because flattens call flattens as the last thing they do. Um, and you, uh, you can get rid of the plus pluses altogether. So again, maybe that's a bit rushed, but the details are in the uh, in the paper. This tree traversal is really giving you a, a zipper, and you might even see that in this picture here. This red stuff is a zipper showing where this tree T2 is in the context of the whole tree. Um, and so you get the uh, you get the zipper uh, by doing this technique. It's it's what it's the defunctionalized continuations that you get for the, for the identity function on trees. And Connor McBride has a very nice paper, uh, Clowns to the Left and Me Jokers to the Right, about uh, more about tree traversals. And the data representation he has there, um, Clowns and Jokers representation, uh, is what you get by doing the same technique to map over trees. So there are some things, you, you turn a tree of A's into tree of B's. If you want to make that tail recursive, then partway through, you've turned some A's into B's, but not the other ones. And you need a representation of this kind of tree that has some A's that you turned into B's and some A's that you've yet to visit. Uh, so that's the, the, the clowns and the jokers, the things to one side of you and the things to the other side of you. So that again comes out of exactly the same construction, uh, uh, CPS and defunctionalization um, and associativity. Paul's there, any uh, questions yet, Eric? Uh... No, but a comment that some eagle-eyed folk, or eagle-eyed folks, had uh, noticed the link to clowns and jokers paper. We're asking about that. <laughs> Good. Um, yes, it's a lovely paper. I commend it to you. I think Connor mentions the connection, but doesn't make very much of it, and reinvents the representation. And uh, my my uh, perspective on it is that. Um, the representation doesn't need clever insight. It just it's just a turning this familiar handle over and over again. One other thing. Um, yeah. So so far they're asking why uh, Idris versus Haskell. Right. Good. Excellent question because that's coming up. Uh, all of that could have been done perfectly well in Haskell. Um, so here's a another example. Um, this is a little expression language, uh, and it has been called Hutton's Razor because Graham Hutton's written lots of papers about calculating compilers using very simple expression languages like this. But one difference with Hutton's razor is Graham uses addition as a binary operator. I'm going to use subtraction because it's not associative and I want to focus on where associativity comes up. So it's confusing to have uh, associativity in the application domain. Addition is associative. Um, I want to have something that's not associative. So here are some expressions. They're either literals or a subtraction. Here is an expression at three minus four minus five, um, and it looks like this tree here. And here's an evaluation function. Um, and it's, uh, it's the obvious thing, but it's not tail recursive because there are two recursive calls to evaluation. If we just turn the handle again, CPS it uh, with an identity continuation and you build some stuff up. So in the recursive case, evaluate left-hand side, get a result, call it N, evaluate the right-hand side, get a result, call it N, Compute m minus n and then apply the continuation k to it. It's tail recursive. Eval calls eval, but it's higher order because it has continuations. So you defunctionalize the continuations. And very much like tree traversal, there are left things and there are right things. Here we don't need to go right to left. So we're just going to do the obvious left to right thing. So when you go and in, descend into a left child, you've got the expression to the right of you to remember and come back to. When you descend into a right child, you've got the integer from the left-hand side. And you might think of these things as stack frames um, in recursive call. So that's why I call them frames. Uh, so you have a list of them, um, uh, like with uh, flattening, um, and you, you push things onto the stack and you pop things from the stack, and this gives you a stack-based uh, interpreter for this tiny little language. It's really an interpreter, not a compiler, because the stack contains some values, but also some un unevaluated expressions. Uh, so the expressions hang around at runtime, so to speak. Um, and so, uh, but if it were a compiler, you'd have to get rid of all the expressions and there'd be this phase distinction between the time when you have expressions and the later time when you don't. 
that's a pity because we know there is a stack-based uh, compilation scheme for little expression languages. Here's a, a, a virtual machine, if you like, an abstract machine. Um, uh, there, there are two kinds of instructions. There's a push instruction to push something onto a stack and a subtraction instruction that pops the top two things off the stack, does a subtraction and pushes the result back onto the stack. So our expression uh, would push three onto the stack, push four onto the stack, do a subtraction to get minus one, push five onto the stack, do another subtraction to get minus six. Um, uh, a program is a list of instructions. Uh, compilation turns uh, an expression into a list of instructions, um, and that's just a, a, a structural recursion, a fold over the expressions. And then execution takes a list of instructions and an initial stack and gives you a final stack. Um, uh, to the push instruction pushes something on the stack, and the subtraction instruction takes two things off the stack and subtracts them. Oh, and be careful about the order because subtraction is, as well as not being associative, it's not commutative. So you have to be careful about which way around you do the subtraction. So then the, an evaluator is the composition of these two things. You compile your expression into a program, which is a list of instructions, and then you run this program on the initially empty stack and you'll get a singleton stack, which will, be the, which will contain just the value of the expression. Uh, and so you just take the, the, the single value off that singleton stack and that's the result that you return. How do I get from this uh, recursive interpreter to this um, uh, iterative execution, this, this abstract machine? So this is, uh, Graham Hutton has done a lot of work on this um, and uh, some nice papers in JFP showing how to calculate this, but I find them uh, unsatisfactory because um, uh, like Connor did in the Clowns and Jokers paper, he needs some, he uses some operational insight into what's going on uh, in the derivation. Uh, he basically reinvents stacks. Um, uh, so the next step, so one of the steps in the, in the method is to transform the function into one that use, utilizes a stack in order to, well, in order to do something. Why do you do this? I've got some idea of how this execution should work. And in order to implement it, I need to have a stack. And uh, I'm going to show that that insight is unnecessary because again, it just comes by turning the handle. You don't need uh, this, um, this operational reasoning to say, we, we ought to have a stack, so let's introduce a stack and then, uh, and then we'll end up with the right function. So he introduces, Graham introduces stacks and also, um, functions from stacks to stacks, so stack transformers. Uh, so basically he's writing continuation passing style programs over, over stacks. Um, why does he do this? In order to, here, to make the flow of control explicit. So uh, again, I think that uh, operational reasoning is, is unfortunate and unnecessary, and I'm gonna show how to get rid of it. So I hope the expression stuff is all very straightforward and, uh, um, uh, the answer, so the answer to the question why Idris is, is coming up. So the key insight is uh, about this thing called generalized composition, which is actually due to Mitch Wand in this lovely paper from 1982, uh, which um, is not as well known as I think it should be. So what's going on here? So this evaluator uh, in CPS, in continuation passing style, uh, takes a continuation K, you evaluate the left-hand side, get a result call it M, you evaluate the right-hand side, get a result call it N, and then you do K of N minus N. Uh, you can see this, these lambdas as routing uh, values from one place to another, but different numbers of values. You need to root just K into E, but you need to root K and M into E prime. And composition does routing, but in order to root different numbers of things, you need a, a generalization of composition. Um, so uh, Mitch called this B, he wrote a capital B. I'm gonna use a little B because my identifiers are lowercase letters. Um, B is the, the traditional name for the composition combinator. So, and the, the, the superscript here is the arity. So B1 is just function composition. B0 is function application, um, and uh, you can define BR plus one in terms of BR. 
Um, what it turns out is, is VR of two functions, G and F, is like the composition of G and F, but instead of passing one thing into it, F, you pass R things into F. So you might think of it as this box here. In order, why Idris? Well, you need Idris in order to implement this generalized composition in a type safe way. You can do it in an untyped way, which is what Mitch does in this paper from 1982. And you can do it in a dependently typed way in Idris. And you can do it in Haskell by imitating the dependent types, um, but you can't do it in a type safe way in ML, for example, without dependent types. Uh, oops. And the trick, well, the representation is this type level function, which I've called arrow here. Arrow A's B um, is, is the type of functions that take a list of arguments of length corresponding to A's and types get given by A's and return a result of type B. So here, here's arrow to two. Um, arrow takes a list of types for the input types and a type for the output type. Um, so the arity2 function from taking Charles and bools and giving you strings is uh, the function type char to bool to string. Um, and that's what you get out of this definition here. Um, and this, this now is the Idris program that implements this generalized composition. And I need these arrow things um, and in order to inspect them in order to work out whether I should be doing compositions or applications. So this is very, very sweet. Um, and it was much hackier and much more complicated when I did it in Haskell. And I was very happy to discover how simple it fell out in Idris. So I'm a, I'm a convert to dependent type programming because of this. But now um, we can use this. Here's our evaluator again. Um, and uh, I'm just going to introduce some shorthands for, for the, the three things that cropped up there. Um, halt, return, and sub. Um, and then using the definition of this generalized composition, I can rewrite this, uh, the recursive case as a, um, a little pipeline of do the left-hand side, do the right-hand side, then do a subtraction with appropriate plumbing to get the values threaded through. Uh, then I plug that into my evaluator um, and uh, it's, um, it's not tail recursive anymore, but it does suggest a, a representation. I can represent literals by something corresponding to return. And then here I need something corresponding to B1, something corresponding to B2, and something corresponding to sub. Um, so let, here's a data type of return and B1 and B2 and sub. Um, and it's a representation of expressions. Uh, so I can just straightforwardly defunctionalize this uh, higher order program into a first order program using this data type. Uh, the ret here turns into a rep with a capital R and the B1 turns into a capital B1 and so on. This expression type is, a type is an index type and the index tells you how many more values you need in order to complete evaluation. So when you return an integer, you'll get an integer and you don't need anything more. When you do subtraction, you'll get an integer, but you need two more, two input values in order to do that. And this is how the compositions work. If you, this one needs zero and this one needs one and then you'll get, get zero. So that's, uh, you turn expressions into this representation, and then you turn this representation back into um, uh, some higher order thing. Um, so there's an integer, integer type, and then one of these arrow gadgets. And this just interprets rets as rets, subs as subs, b1s as b1s, b2s as b2s. So obviously, if I take this defunctionalized b1 to a b1 with a capital letter, and then turn b1 back into b1, b1 with a little letter, um, I'm going to get the same behavior as the evaluator. This is kind of obviously correct, but it's not helpful yet um, because all we've done is, is taken the recursive evaluator, tree-shaped evaluator, um, turned it into a tree-shaped representation and then got a tree-shaped uh, interpretation of that back again. Uh, so we still don't have uh, the linear code that we wanted. Where does the linear code come from? Well, that's the final step. The step, final step is, of course, associativity. Um, and generalized composition is, of course, associative, just like function composition. So the box, the, the picture here shows what I mean. Uh, 
and the wiring should make it entirely clear that these two things are the same. It's the same wiring. Um, and what's the grey box here says this one is a composition um, composition of H and G on the left hand side with F plugged in is the same as a composition of uh, G and F with an H on the result. Um, and you just need to then work out what the right parities are to make this all type correct. Um, but this is an associativity. This says that uh, left nested Bs can turn into right nested Bs with some fiddling of the parameters. That's why I call it pseudo associative rather than associative because the, uh, the arities have to be uh, sorted out. But this is the thing that lets us rotate the tree shape code to make linear code. Um, uh, it lets us re-associate branches of the tree. Um, and let's look at that evaluator again. Um, it was uh, expressed in terms of B1s and B2s. Um, and there's a final application to halt, and that turns out to be another B, that's a B0, B0 is application. And well, uh, with lots of applications of associativity, uh, this uh, sort of tree-shaped structure, um, left and right nesting, uh, can all be rotated, so everything, everything is nested to the right. And all that happens is the, the indices have to change uh, appropriately to keep track of what's going on. It's just applications of that associativity rule. And this gives us a different representation. So we can define eval uh, in, in this way. I mean, this is eval of a particular expression, but you can do the same thing for, uh, for the general case. And then you'll see that all you need is um, but because everything now is now nested to the right only, um, neither this is a base case constructor, and neither of these constructors, each of these const other constructors, uh, takes only a single child and, and produces a result, not two children. So it's not tree shaped, it's linear now. And being linear, uh, we can concatenate these things. So this is. Um, something that will give you a result if you give it R more inputs, and then something that will give you a result if you give it one plus S more inputs. Uh, so you use this one, give, uh, the, take the first R inputs, that will give you an integer and you use that integer here. Uh, and then the remaining S inputs means that you'll get a result um, out of R plus S inputs. Um, and it's just kind of append for this funny type of lists. Uh, it just looks like the append function on lists, um, but with this, with this funny representation. And then uh, we can do the same representation interpretation as before. We turn our expressions into this representation, and then we turn this representation into the, uh, uh, into the higher order thing. They uh, interpret the, expression, the representation as this higher order thing. Um, Halts get interpreted as halts, rects get interpreted as rects, subs get interpreted as subs. But again, you have to be careful about the, the order of arguments to subtraction. So now our tree shaped expression is, has a representation as code, but the representation is linear. So uh, this is an obviously a linear thing. Um, and then if you evaluate it, then you get this expression here, which is um, uh, the thing I calculated as. Um, three minus four minus five a couple of slides ago. And this is the, the linear code. There's a, this B rep three is a push. This is a push. This is a sub. This is a push. This is a sub. And then you halt. So this is where that compiler comes from. Um, uh, you compile your expression into a list of instructions. Um, and these, so these reps are pushes and these subs are subs. Um, so the compiler comes from uh, doing the usual CPS and defunctionalization, but it's this essential application of associativity um, that, that makes this work. And that's my that, that's what I wanted to say. Um, kind of familiar stuff about accumulating parameters and CPS and defunctionalization. Um, I haven't mentioned him, but the, this was all due to John Reynolds and this. Uh, seminal paper from 1972, Definitional Interpreters for Higher Order Programming Languages. 
which Olivier Donvy has done lots of work expanding and showing how to get lots of uh, well-known abstract machines out of known interpreters and turn uh, interpreters into new abstract machines and explain where certain obscure abstract machines, what interpreter they correspond to. Um, so there's a, there's a whole line of work there. But there's an essential appeal to associativity that I think is often missed and, and needs to be highlighted. Uh, and I'm quite pleased with this generalized, generalized composition that Mitch Wand introduced and works very nicely in, in a dependently typed language. If you want to read more, there's a paper uh, uh, to appear in the programming journal, um, but the, the draft is on my webpage. It's the most recent paper on my webpage. Can't find it, send me a link. I'm very happy to take any more questions or to move to chat. I uh, think since we're over time, we'll probably move to the chat. Um, but thank you very much. This is an excellent teaser for the paper. I can't wait to dive in for even more detail. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you.